So um, we're gonna share some some personal experiences. It doesn't mean that it things work it for us will work out for you. I hope not. Uh, but at least uh, we show you some 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 things during our history since eight years now. So let's start by some personal um, history. Uh, I first founded a company which was quite similar to Adyx in 2000. I was 20 years old and I failed it in one, nine months. So I get to pay IRS taxes and for years and years. And then um, a friend of mine had a good idea to launch a video-based um, booking site for uh, luxury apartments and hotels in Paris, which was quite good idea by the time there was no video. And that was actually for a reason. Uh, because if you look at nice hotels rooms with nice uh, big angle photos, it's ju just like dreams, so you reserve it. And if you look with a small video, you actually realize that this room for 1,000 euros a night is just a 10 square meter small room and you'd never buy it. Unfortunately, we noticed it after we launched the site and after filming 250 hotels. So four months after releasing the website, we just realized that we cannot get any money from that. So it was quite good failure. So we decided to pivot. By the time it wasn't pivot, it's just failure. Uh, but we still decided to pivot because the good thing is that actually by, a, by, by totally random, we selected Drupal, Drupal 4.7 at the time to create this website. And, and by the time there was only about 10 companies in France doing Drupal. So we said a good idea, let's try to sell Drupal sites. So the first time we called our company eDrupal, which was quite good in cold call saying, hi, we are eDrupal doing Drupal, quite normal. Then we got a cold call from Dries saying, hey guys, it's cool to call your company eDrupal, but actually you cannot because it's a trademark. So it was doing like, oh, okay, we changed our name, second failure. Uh, but the, the, the thing was, we was thinking about names and names and names, how to call it, Drupal Digital Factory, factory websites, whatever. We was spending hours and hours of brainstorming. And then we called a friend of ours who is big in Hong Kong and who is working as a marketing director for Colgate. And he found uh, the company name in about 27 seconds. He understood that we were doing advertisements, so Jan, Maxim, and Ad Yax was born. Uh, so by this time, we actually, now we, we do 12 million revenue this year and we are quite happy. Uh, we have 12 offices all around the world and opening New York since a couple of months. And we have very good clients, we are very happy with them. But before getting there, we very, from the very beginning we learned some, some hard learned lessons. F the first one was that the, actually the things you don't have to do and you don't need when you start a company. You don't need a website, we didn't have any. Uh, you certainly don't need a business plan and don't need marketing business cards or reporting because when I see young companies, they are all care about, okay, how my business cards look, what is my logo, what my name, and all this is just bullshit, you don't need that. The only thing you need, there are three things you need. The first one is sales. You need contracts, and that's the only thing that is important. The second is obviously sales, and the third one is sales, that's all. The rest for the rest. And the thing is, if you don't have any references, because when you start a company, you cannot just pop into Johnson & Johnson and say, hello, um, we are two here, we're doing Drupal websites, you want us to work with together? So actually you can, sorry, I shouldn't touch that. Please, make it work. Yeah, thank you. So actually, as you saw, many logos of famous, um, uh, Well, it should work now. <laughs> yeah. And this. Actually, it would be quite complicated to talk about failures, to fail projects in slides. Um, but it, it should have worked. Tartula. Uh, <laughs> Please, assistance. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is another w important lesson, having backups. Uh, up. No. Not my, not my. 
Ah, thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. It's okay, we are all ready. Uh, so, as you don't have clients and you cannot show the things you've done, the good thing, what, what changed our, our growth, it was going to see these agencies. They have a lot of creative guys and, and they, they, they do uh, very bad Drupal. Uh, at by the time, very bad Drupal developers. They are not using this technology. They don't have in-house high-skilled developers. <laughs> so we actually called them and it was saying, just we did that, please don't want to give us some business. And actually they do, because they're searching for cheap, small companies to, to subcontract their development tasks. They are not, they don't want to do development because they will have creative. So this is how you gain references, well, actually how we gain references, and then you cut them and you go directly to this big reference saying, oh, actually, we did your website. Um, check your NGA, you never know. But uh, actually you go, you, you say, that, but, Shit happens. Uh, and then you say, but we actually did it, so do you want it to us to continue? And this is how it works. Obviously, after that, they will never send you any businesses again. But that's life. So the second important lessons we've learned, and as we're doing mainly fixed budget projects, is the art of estimates, which actually starts with just find out putting numbers randomly on a sh sheet saying, okay, it looks like 20,000 project is okay, and then you end up paying 45,000 to your developers to end up with 20,000 projects. So what we, uh, what is really important is doing as precise quotes for fixed budgets as possible. We, from what I know after eight years, are, have the most, the longest, the largest quotes in, on earth. I mean, we have quotes of 200 lines. And it actually works because of several points. You can easily negotiate uh, if somebody s sells you, uh, I do front end for 20 days, and you actually say, why not 18 or 16? And it's quite complicated to argument that. But if you are selling a line for 0 0.5 days, nobody say, mm, maybe 0 0.4 is a better number. But th so this is easier to negotiate. Then another problem with fixed budget is that once you started doing, they all want more than they, they buy. So this is normal, this is how clients work. So then g having very detailed quotes gives you a very n simple way to negotiate. Like it wasn't in the quote, my quote is extremely precise, pay more, it's an evolution. Um, and it looks good, it looks professional, like all many numbers. Um, so you see that some numbers are weird there because we actually apply on management, project management and QA work of percentages of development, which is quite standard, but we obviously adapt these numbers based on client we'll talk about later. Uh, but sometimes you cannot do that because the scope of the project is absolutely unknown. And then we actually pick up one from not one company, it was old one company, now it's, I don't know, Wonder Crowd maybe integrated, I don't know. Uh, they have a very good thing of uncertainty factors. So they actually pick up the same lines we do, but instead of putting a precise number, we put a precise number with an uncertainty factor. So if you don't know anything about the parameter, so you put one and it gives you a range. So per line range. So at the end, you end up with a range. So client actually tend to accept that saying, look, your scope is uncertain, so you have a range. And it's quite reassuring for them saying you have a range because it quite of shows you that you are aware of risks, aware of the rea reality of the projects, well, and then you have to remain inside the range. This is a problem. Um, another thing is what happens during the project because you have to keep track of, of um, change requests because this is, happens all the time. You have a year project, so you started with a fixed bid and then you have changes. So as you are not in time and material, the prob there is no problem in time and material. I mean, we don't talk about that because time and material is just bill. You have to keep track of all the small changes. You can send quotes each time they want something. They change a button, 20 euros, 100 euros quote. That's not sustainable on a big project. So we keep track of a shared document. We have total credit, total debit. So each time they ask something, we make them validate on this document, and then we just add up numbers. So in monthly rate or each quarter, we just bill the amount and we clean up this table. 
So another thing we learned, because we was working with agencies to so just send you stuff without RFP, just I need a website, 10K, 20K, 30K, okay, let's go start then. Once you work directly with big clients, you enter the RFP process. And uh, it's a good game. I mean, I like RFP's process because, um, so this is kind of numbers we have. If we had get an incoming bids from some client calls us saying, do you want to participate? Our average winning rate is about 70%. If we call clients and we are doing cold calls or, or marketing efforts or we are outbound, then we the, 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 we it drops to 30%. So how it's different? At, at the end, we all go through RFP processes. The problem is that in usually in what from what I understand, I don't know why it like that, but from what I understand, uh, when they when you call them, they accept to put you in RFP process, but they already have their preferred client or the preferred set of uh, vendors that they want to work with, which actually happens when they call you. So it's important from any possible way to create this relationship and to, to give trust to your, to your potential client. So one thing we learned also is you have to, during your answer, you don't have to talk about you at all. This is elementary. I mean, each time you, you explain how beautiful you are, what good your references are, how your methodology is, you usually fail. So instead of sending like 100 pages of, uh, of description of how you, you are, good you are, it's better to show you examples and details. Example, this is way better, and I have a client who actually saw this during the RFP process here. It's way better for a client to show you back office interface saying, look, we did this, 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 and this, even if it's not very beautiful, but it's very detailed, rather than just showing showing something like this, oh, we did Gellan. So because uh, the clients are not always able to project to, to your project inside their project. So you have to do the job for them. Take parts of your project and show them concrete example. And the more you go into the details, uh, the more you show the imp your implication, the importance of this RFP for you, and the understanding also. Oh, I know we did that before. Knowing the client's business is another important thing. We now never go to an RFP or, or, a, or a presentation or a session without trying to understand exactly what is the business of the client. Even if it's only technical migration from Drupal, from Typo Free to Drupal or from Adobe to Drupal or from whatever to Drupal, we still, during the process, n try to learn as much as possible who is their competition. Is it a complicated business? Um, what are the ch sales channel? Why? Because during the conversation, you have to create this small link between you and the trust link within your clients. And knowing their business, it's easier. When I go to see a publishing company and we talk ab and I bring in uh, with a journalist, for example, so they talk the same languages, same small jokes or same sad stories. This is how it helps you to create this trust. So this is an example. Another, when I come to a publishing company, I show you, look, we know how to build your, uh, uh, your workflow. Look, we did very complicated workflow for another publishing company. So it shows you the level of your, of your expertise. Another way is the changing the game. I give you a story. We received a very large public RFPs from uh, Health Ministry of Health in France, very large, multi-million public RFP. So we was against Accenture and uh, Capgemini, very large companies, right? So the initial thing it was create a portal to um, aggregate all the healthcare information around different producers. They have hundreds of uh, uh, producers, uh, public producers of in health information like eCancer, Opital.gov, uh, etc. So we aggregate and we get one. Uh, portal named Sante.fr, which is health.fr. So we know that if we were competing on portals with big companies, we are sure to lose the, because we are small um, and we don't have all this process. So what we actually did, look, this is bullshit. Don't create a portal. No, but it will never work. Let's create a Google Now of Health, an app, totally different thing. And it actually worked because there it was a specific public 
uh, process, buying process, when you can meet the client several times during the process. So they actually change the RFP and they redo the, the RFP with our recommendation, creating an app, health.com, etc. So now the other, the big guys was, were in trouble because they didn't understand why the RFP changed from one round to another. And uh, because we actually prepared the RFP for that, we was ready to answer. They had to change everything. They was answering on the portal team, and now they are answering to an app team. This is a way to change the game. We actually won the project, and we are releasing it in end of November. There are many ways to change, to change the deal. For example, another company came to us to say, look, we want to migrate our, one of our website to Drupal. Um, we said, no, you should migrate all your website to Drupal, even your boutique and your e-commerce website. So again, we changed the RFP because the authors guys were not, uh, there was all very good in creating corporate website, but have no experience in e-commerce. So we changing, by changing the RFP, we change the scale and the competition. So this is, works very well. Also, you have to keep in mind specifically when you have very large RFPs, you usually have to fill up like hundreds of lines. Do you do the uh, compliance matrix? And do your solution do that? Yes, 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 yes. Actu and there are guys spending hours and hours just filling right in comments column. Nobody read that. It's actually just to calculate the, some, some numbers. Your still RFP process have to convince the guys. So the most important is not the exactitude of your RFP, except for public because then you have to be very careful with rules. Don't play with the rules if you are confident. You just have to convince the guy that your solution or your enterprise is better than the rest. So for example, another uh, RFP for um, Sephora, uh, we was again competing against very big companies and there was like 300 lines to, to fill and we answered this RFP in 24 hours because I forgot this RFP. So in 24 hours, we obviously cannot uh, respond to all the things. So we actually produced 60 slides of just talking about their projects and, and how we did it. And we won again, we, even if we did not feel and our um, compliance score was zero out of 10, ra rather than others get 10 out of 10, but still won because actually they feel uh, comfortable with our team. And another big uh, question specifically, the price. We noticed that price is absolutely never an issue. You will never lose a project because of price. I mean, important to explain to you, if you explain to your client, you sell, you all sell here, well, some of you, you all sell time. If you are in time's material, it will be your rate card. You probably hire the same developers with the same salaries in the same locations, so your competition have almost the same rate cards, so it's never an issue. You will not, in, in the same town, you not have uh, two companies having uh, different rate cards on the same resources because they are the same. If you are going to fixed budget, here you have the big price ranges. Somebody will answer 20K, someone will answer 200K for the same project, same RFP. So here you have to be very smart in explaining how you build up your estimate and what is included and what is not. Obviously, you can option the maximum things to, to, to lower the total number, but also you have to explain everything you do uh, in details. So if they compare, I have 200 lines quote here and I have 10 lines quote here. So obviously, I don't buy the same. So they ask them if, if, they, if they start to ask you about questions about price, say them, okay, uh, did they do that? Did they include that? Did they include that? And then they will start to compare and the numbers will grow up on the other side. Another good approach we learned is to being expensive, very expensive from the first shot. Doing that, you actually, if you are twice the, the price of the, of the client, if it, it, it's a very good insight because if you are just in the budget, plus minus 10 percent, they go, is my price okay? Yeah, yeah, no, more or less. And then you get no information. If you are twice um, more expensive than the rest, you call them, you are mad, you are twice more expensive. Okay, no problem. So you know the price, you know the price of the others. So then you can say, oh, sorry, we added some things. <laughs> this is a good way. Another important way, it's, it's Achille uh, in the background, because Achille have a problem with his, uh, so it's easy to kill. You have to know your competition. So you're going in RFP, the most important is not even the budget of the client, uh, you will understand that based on their size and the, the quality of the RFP. It's more to understand who against who you compete. If you are competing against editor solution, you will push on open source. If you get 
co competing with small companies, you will have to push on reassuring how big you are. If you are fighting with big companies, then you have to push on flexibility, etc. So you have to adapt your answers based on who in front of you you have. It's not easy to know uh, who your competition is, but again, um, all tricks of calling guys, saying but who is in front, how many companies, checking what they did previously, who did their website previously, who did their intranet, who did, because obviously they will work with a small group of persons. Or you can just check your classical competition references and see if they have already them in their clients. Um, obviously you have to be extremely careful with larger public RFPs because all these tricks will never work later, so you can answer yes everywhere, but you can say yes to very dangerous things that you'll have to assume later, like 24 hours support in five languages, or 9.9 .9, uh, web content ability, or the last one, the average response time of the web contents must be less than 20 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, which will be quite difficult to obtain with Drupal, specifically with Drupal 8. <laughs> so, um, HR. Um, we learn a lot of things with, uh, um, because we are so distributed, we have 12 offices, so we, we, we don't have all these big, big office places where everybody can exchange. So we learned some lessons here too. For instance, the culture is the most important thing we have. Uh, well, it's obvious to say that, but it's, you don't realize that because at the beginning we were thinking, well, we need rock stars. So we was hunting on Drupal camps, like I want this contributor, top contributor. I want this top rock star there. This guy works for Capgemini, I want them. And actually this is less important. Culture, because it's something that you set up at the very beginning and then it's continued to spread around your company. So if you plant a bad seed at the beginning, you will end up with a big piece of shit. So plant the good seed at the beginning. So if you can define your culture, then it's okay. Just w so we have this, we, I just make the exercise. So we have humor and sarcasm. So somebody who knows us will know that we are very humorous and very sarcastic. We, can, we love parties and events. I don't remember what happens yesterday night, but anyway, but we still focus on results and quality, not time, results and quality. Whatever happens, we end up with a project. And finally, we have autonomy and respect. We don't have pro very high level. We are very flat company, so we let guys doing whatever they want. And cultural melting point, that's something defined us. We have guys from uh, India, from, from Ukraine, from Russia, from whatever country we have, France, uh, Syria, yes, and uh, many others. So reporting, something that we also noticed is that checking that the guys doing their job is, we, we, at the beginning we was very scared because guys was all working remotely, so we was, obsessed with guys logging more hours than they actually do and they are doing Facebook or whatever. So it actually was a big mistake. If you give autonomy and responsibility, people do a great job. You don't have to check and report. You ha we will have some reporting, I will show you them. But autonomy and responsibility is the most important things. You actually get m way better results if you don't over control or micromanage guys. And actually the reporting and reviewing things, you, we, we failed to, to set up this because as you're growing, we're growing at 30% rate each year because so the staff going, so you, you never have time. You're always, everybody's always uh, on the staff. They have overtime and you don't have time to do reviews, reporting. So we, s we, we cut it off. But instead we started since uh, some years to implement some automatic tools because we need some control over, t we, we are almost 300, so we need some control. So first thing we implemented is a project alert. Everybody can use it. They have access in all, on all screens. They can just put, click on it and say, I feel an alert. Everybody in the company can say that. So we don't have specification, we have over budget, poor quality, whatever. And this alert is immediately treated by the top management. We have to accept that. So it's very simple. And uh, the, the problem was, is uh, main problem was that people was at the beginning scared to do alerts. I uh, will get fired if I have an alert saying that my boss is just a piece of bullshit not doing his specification. We said, no, we fired nobody and then we fired the guy anyway, so <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's, it's a very important tool it, in, in, and it works. It works because you get, because usually the problems, you will see them at the level, very low level. QA guys, developers, not on the project manager. Project manager usually say, I manage, everything is okay, and actually it's not. So you have to get these bottom-top alerts. 
Second thing we have implemented is a dashboard to help uh, project managers to supervise um, uh, supervise their, uh, their hours, what was sold, what was done. Well, it's quite complicated, but for those who use it, is we have tasks and everything, so it's, it's I, I actually it will have to be adapted to each of your company. But the idea is to say, we offer a tool, because we don't do reviewing and reporting, we offer a tool to, se to self-control the projects. Okay, where I am, what I did, how many hours I've spent. Um, and, and, s and again, I took an example from a project that somebody knows, and, uh, and the client can see in this room that we do way more hours than we actually sell to them. So um, another, uh, another uh, so this is a continuous screen of, of the previous uh, tool. So we have some big um, um, uh, information here, top, info top, in top important information like total hours per users. So we control who works, how many times. <coughs> top time consuming tasks so we can spot uh, bottlenecks in the projects and we have tasks with no time logged inside so that means that or we it's very important for us to to track everything so we ask to everybody track their time in the right task not during eight hours of working we ask to do more precise but so we have a control here to see if there are no t task with no time that means that somebody work on it but probably never logged then bonuses we've Experienced bonuses system, uh, we still have this bonuses system, but actually it absolutely doesn't change the way of the project works. So it's written everywhere, there was uh, scientific experiences confirming that, but you still want to, if I give you more money from the margin, you will do better projects. No. Uh, motivation and um, is more important. If the guys are motivated by a project, they'll do great job. If there is a shitty, boring project, Regardless of the money, they will do shitty, boring job. So, but it obviously money is important to keep or recruit no new personnel. If you don't pay you guys enough money, they will leave, that's normal. But bonuses system, it never worked. I don't know why, but uh, we have tried all the combination possible, no change in, 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 in project setup. And of course, we also um, uh, have to ban the rock stars assholes. I have a story of, um, of a partner or, or, or a similar company. Um, I cannot name it, obviously, because we don't treat people assholes. But uh, they, they have a rock star with him, but he was really an asshole inside the team, like, like, like really, really bad with his team members. And they, I've talked with the boss of this company saying, you should fire him, but he's a rock star. He's a very good contributor. And uh, I said, no. And actually, it, 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 it it was very bad for them because people inside the company started to leave, saying why he's still here, I don't like to work with them, if this bad spirit starts to spread like a cancer. So as soon as we got spotted an asshole, we fired them immediately, even if it's very good. And we fired a couple of guys who was extremely good, but real assholes. Get rid of them, you need to create a team. The team is way better than, uh, than individuals. Uh, we still have uh, some pain, is uh, resources planning. Uh, it's a manual, painful process. Uh, yes, this is the image I, I think of when I think about resources planning. So we don't have a magic tool saying that this developer will be free in two weeks. We have something manually, we review all the project managers, but still it's not automatic because it project sleeps all the time, they have shifting in, in plannings, client is late, well, it's too well, we don't have the magic formula, so if you have, please. Um, finally, the money. Uh, the finance, uh, so we, until, until uh, I would say, um, three, four years ago, uh, we was able to control everything by, by overviewing things. I know here the client will pay, the project will be ending, we got 100K here, we still have to spend these salaries. It was okay. In one time, it happens in a couple of months, we lost completely control of what really happens inside the company. It was too big. And this kind of spreadsheet working, it doesn't work. So we implemented in a, in a very short time period, a lot of um, reporting stuff and, 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 and KPIs. So we actually, this is a KPI we track inside. We have production per head. Why it's important? Because when you do times material, your production is actually your bills. So you invoice weekly, so what you invoice is, is what you produced. When you do fixed budget, imagine you sign off a one million euro project over two years, 
what is your production? You never know. If you are, you are, you are sending 30% uh, invoice at the beginning, 70% at the end. Well, it's not like that, but imagine. So your progress on, the, on this bill is not, and it's how much you produce. Margins is obviously the most important on fixed budget because you don't know them at the beginning. And bookings are also important to see what your next year will be. Uh, number of active clients. This shows you if you are really growing. It's, it's important in, in indication of how you are growing. Is, or, you, or you are growing with less clients, with bigger clients, or you are multiplying small clients. Average bid is like average cart. It's important also. And average invoice. Uh, shows you the, the, the how good you are on, on invoicing. So this is the software we have. So we have Salesforce for leads and opportunity pipe. That's all. Everything goes then. Um, we have also Open ERP, but now it's called Odo. They changed the name so, 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 I don't know how. Let's call it Open ERP. And we'll have invoice and quotes. And we have Redmine for logged hours and projects and everything uh, all the reporting is consolidated in the Postgre uh, database, which is then used for Tableau Software BI reporting, very good uh, software, and, uh, and some uh, internal in individual reporting system. So this is the first example of uh, what I call production per head. We actually ask for each project manager to list all the uh, quotes they have and to see what is the progress on this particular quote. And that is all aggregated. So we have the production per head and the to grand total. So we can see uh, if somebody is understaffed or overstaffed or is not producing enough. So we can see what happens. Um, but we also give a tool for each individual to track down uh, everything what happens in their project. So if they access to this tool, they see what happens currently in their project. So they see where they are in advancement, what are the total cost of the team, months per month, and they see if they are good. And there is an alert also, it's saying, okay, that the margin is okay. If it is, if it is red, it will popping everywhere, saying, okay, guys, 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 you're running out of money. Another thing is, in theory, this is a theory about S-curves. Uh, it's, it shows the life of a project in terms of costs. So it's, it's theoretical. So we w try to, to implement that internally to see how it really happens in the real life. So we got that. So this is a uh, margin over time. Uh, so it starts uh, by design phase. So you work, few guys are working on it. So it's very, um, uh, very low consumption because you couple guy, UX designer and project manager. And then you have the development team, the build phase. <laughs> then you start to burn much more money. And at the end, you are in the road. So you, you reduce the team just for the back fixing. And it's in smoothly landing. This is the perfect solution. And this is how I would be rich. And fortunately, there are also these kind of S-curves <laughs> who actually reach the zero and then goes down and then I start to pay for the client. So it happens also, unfortunately this is life. So you have to control and you can control and you can adapt with this tool early and to avoid hitting down too hard. All this bullshit is absolutely useless if you do crappy job, that's just natural. So the most important is QA. So in 2008, I was doing the tests. It was quite okay for a couple of websites we were doing. Then we asked it to developers doing tests. Guys, why are you doing bugs? It was a stupid idea. And then in 2011, we hired QA guys doing tests. And only a couple of years ago, we started asking them to do QA and not tests. Because what is important to understand that the QA guys don't do testing, they do quality assurance. So they check that the requirements are met and the test plan is think and organized. So you don't have to hire small hands to click on the Internet Explorer 6, 7, 8, and 10. You have to hire smart guys who are able to create a coverage of your projects to, to create a test plan, how to test and organize the testing. And actually today we have 20% uh, of our workforce are, are just dedicated to QA, uh, and it's not enough. Uh, when we see, we have this also reporting tool, which is a test relative effort per project. So you see the percentage of the test testing efforts compared to the development efforts. And you see the range is going from 35% for very simple uh, or standard projects up to 50 and more for complicated projects. I think the first one is an error, but okay. Anyway, so the, what the regular number for doing high quality job is to 50% of your time, of development time is dedicated to QA. Creating tests, running them, maintaining automatic tests. 
you have a lot of, have to do a lot of testing to do quality job. And again, quality teams do not have bugs. They actually check that the pr what the developers created meet the requirements. So if your requirements are bad, then they cannot s uh, s uh, save your project. So we have another uh, uh, metric we, uh, we, we, we track in quality is what we call the cost of rework. So it's the amount of time, the cost of bug, bug fixing, bug hunting, everything related to bug versus actual total cost of the project. So you have immediately, and we what we, when we just implemented that KPI, we see immediately that the top projects are the complicated project, we get problems. And what we also noticed with analyzing all these numbers is that if it is under 15% of the cost, you have a perfect project. If you are between 15 and 20% of cost of rework, you have a technical debt problem. So actually, you you're rushing your architecture, so you're creating crappy models and you go fast to meet deadlines, but okay. And if you are over 20%, that's a requirement problem. So you solved something that was not poorly, uh, poorly uh, um, described, bad specification, and actually you are redoing stuff again and again and again. It, it can be a never ending project. So you have to be very careful from the beginning. Uh, project management efforts is also very depending on the client and uh, depending of, of the complexity of, of the project, but the most important is it shows the client maturity. Um, if you have less than 20% of project management, then you have a mature, digital mature client. If you are over 30, if it's a large organization with tens and tons of people trying to give their ideas about your job, so you have to explain them, no, it's not a good idea, no, it's not a good idea, and again and again. Uh, finally, e again, for the team and for the client, we set up a very simple um, KPIs that are calculated, as you may see in Google Docs, which shows you the efficiency, the quality, and the post-delivery uh, quality on the KPI. So actually we track some numbers like velocity variation, rework effort, test efficiency, et cetera, and effect. You can find all these metrics that are very well known. You just tap them in on Google. You will see how to calculate them. And we show to the client these small gasoline things so they can see that we, we are quite efficient. The quality is quite okay, but still. And the post-delivery was very bad, but I think because we didn't uh, uh, set some numbers at the, at the end. And for the run, because we also have a support team running the project, H24, we have a little bit more uh, KPIs like a quality, efficiency, and SLA. Do we meet the SLA or not? Because if you don't meet the SLA, then you pay penalties automatically. So, And cost variation. So again, this is helps your team to really understand how they do, and it helps the client, to, because sometimes the clients say, I feel you are not good enough. The quality is not as it used to be. And, and, and he cannot explain why, and you cannot explain why. You ask your guys, everything is perfect, you ask me, everything is bad. So you have some real numbers to show them. Sales. Um, obviously, we run until 12 with only two guys doing sales. We have a sales guy uh, who is doing cold calls, and we have a very smart, intelligent, beautiful guy doing bid management. It's me. <laughs> so together we reached 12 millions. How? Basically, um, well, the first of all, the case studies are the most important source of leads. You can talk everything, but what we ask to our clients or potential prospects is to call our clients, existing clients, to spend time, we organize events where they can talk together. We try to just not to talk about ourselves, but talk about our projects. We show e examples, right? Then, what we also discovered is that cold calls work. We have uh, marketing, uh, content marketing, we have retargeting, we have uh, uh, ACO, we have, well, okay, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, whatever ads. Cold calls work pretty well. We, just last year, we, we get like, I think a million new of revenue just because of cold calls. Obviously, you have to find the right guy. And also, even if it doesn't work, you don't sign exactly, it's still a marketing effort. The guys will hear of you because it's a small community. Actually, the big organization doing digital, the guys are switching from one organization. I heard, I heard a guy called about months ago telling about Drupal. So it's also marketing efforts. On the reverse, there I see a lot of agencies having account managers everywhere. They have five, ten account managers, sorry. Um, 
we don't have any. And I think that account managers work for very large organizations like Johnson & Johnson, LVMH, then you have to talk, to go, to advocate about you. But <coughs> your project managers are way better account managers to do business. They can sell things, and as soon as I get the bid, I don't talk to the client about sales anymore. I will spend time with them, but all the sales process is then in hands of project manager. They are day-to-day -day meeting the client. They know better his habits. They, don't, they know, know better how to sell, and it's way easier to learn an engineer how to sell, right manner, rather than to a salesman ask them to do engineering you know, or understand complicated tasks. So this is how we actually only two people reach to 12 million. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is in Gaelic, so I don't know if it's Irish guy here. Probably they understand. Hope I didn't write something bad here. And if you have any questions, so welcome. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, they don't have to report a lot because the only thing they report is logging hours and we only structure our Redmine task in a very specific way. But then everything else is automatically gathered because the hours are locked in specific tasks. We have a specific workflow in Redmine, so we set up a very specific workflow in Redmine. We have a very specific organization of tasks in Redmine, epics and user stories and classification of each task, and then they log hours, and everything is automatically re uh, generated. And, and all the subjective info, like uh, the, the, the rates and the, the risks and all this stuff? Well, we d we if, well <coughs> actually we don't have so much subjective information. We have uh, this reporting form, alerts form. We also have in Redmine popping up time to time now, we will have this how do you rate this project, like, don't, don't like, but that's all. Uh, we don't, the subjective information are gathered after we get an alert or after we, after we check out there is a problem, but all the, the things I showed is automatically generated. There is, ah, yes, there is one is advancement of the, uh, advancement of the quotes on the fixed budget to see the production per head. This is, there is a guy going, hello, this is your list, how it, it, it takes like five minutes per guy just to see uh, what are the percentage of advancements, that's all. Well, actually, it takes a little bit more, but you know. Any other? Uh, yes? It, it depends, it depends, good question. Half of the bids I do it myself because I have, I'm, I'm well, doing it for eight years, I'm faster than others. So then you have, we have also metrics uh, on past projects so we know quite precisely and then yes, we ask them to time to time to spend half a day to do a quote and estimates. And it that actually estimates are not the, the, the worst in terms of time consuming activity. Creating an answer that corresponds to the client needs, this takes time. <laughs> Filling up numbers, it takes, even if very large, it takes a couple of hours. You know, okay, because we, we, we know what we do, so it's not surprising. So, but the creating the answer, this is, takes time. This, this takes me 80%, 120% of my time. So, uh, there was another question there, yeah. And then yeah. No, well, it's okay. We, I think it's more, if you speak loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. You're a big guy, so you yeah. should. First of all, thank you. It was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, one, I have actually three questions. Ah, <laughs> you have to be, it's, the first one is free. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first one was just a panic about the bidding and how actually you break down, because you said you can reach up to, to, to... 200 lines, yes, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, we, well, actually, I'm technical, quite technical guy, so I know what, uh, well, almost, well, I, I used to know what I was talking about. <laughs> now it's a little bit different. But, yeah, the idea is to split our, up the features and templates and small features and all parallel activity like setup in platform uh, integrations. You actually extract from the bid everything. You, if you see one word is SSO, 
So you automatically know that you have to integrate um, a DFS, LDAP, and SSO protocol. So you have to set up maybe some CAS server, and, and you write up lines each time. So one single word in the RFP can end up with five lines of your, on your code. And then, second, and then you can go back to the third question because we have one, yes? Yeah. What was the uh, it was about when when we goes from five to seven million, five to seven million of revenue at this point. Boom. How many people did I have? I don't remember. Hundred eighty, I think. But you know, we have we, 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 our our structure is a little bit different because we have a lot of uh, QA, for example, or, or well, so it's it's it maybe doesn't correspond to your teams, but. I, I, I as you don't ma oversee the projects, and I would say when you are reaching more than 40 concurrent projects in the same time, you're probably losing control. Second question. Okay, about uh, the bone system. Yeah. Is there a way how to evaluate the performance or is how you divide the bonus after the project? No, we gave 5% of margins to, uh, to, to at the end. We sum up all the margins, so it's more like a bonus at the end of the year. Uh, and it's not related to performance or activity. It's we 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 abandon that because as soon as you start to do that, people start to working for the KPI and not for for the job. So we 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 don't do that. We raise salaries, we get bonuses because they rushed on the project. But we decide when and why. But no automatic things with KPIs because well, it just didn't work. Yeah, it's it's quite uh, we, yes we we are we 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 decide at the managers levels well the, there is a margins but the, that's all but at the end you sum up everything if you lose if on of if on all your projects we lose money so well we don't get bonus but we don't take money from the guys <laughs> uh, uh, but if they are overperforming on their projects so they get some bonuses but it's 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 not automatic we don't have this automatic I know that for example in buffer dot uh, the buffer company, you know, they are very transparent, so they have a very smart formulas of giving bonuses and performance and location. Well, I don't have that. I don't, I don't know. It didn't work for us. Maybe it works elsewhere. So, yes. So my question is, uh, how did you get from the zero uh, uh, video website project to the one million point? <laughs> At what point did you start like, hiring people? Oh, it, it was uh, the first time we, we was started to hire quite immediately because we need developers so uh, but then we we actually as soon as we realized that we will fail uh, we called this uh, I, I remember this was TBWA and publicists saying hello uh, we do Drupal and we are in Drupal it was easy and then we they received it because Drupal is cool and then we spent two hours and they gave a test project both of them small projects 7k or 8k I don't remember and we started like that, and then they, as we perform well on the first iteration, they give more project, and they have uh, hundreds of small projects they don't want to do themselves, so they just give it to the cheaper bidder. So we were at the time we were cheaper, so we uh, gather all all this money from them. So well, small money, but at the time it was okay. Oh, yes. I, I compete against everybody. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. no, actually it changed. We started as a Drupal shop, competing against uh, other Drupal shops and, uh, and actually taking some businesses from agency. Now, obviously, there is two steps. We have two levels of competition, Sidecore and Adobe. Oh, sorry, I have a meeting. No. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. But okay, uh, so yes, now we have two levels of competition. The first, Adobe and Sidecore, all the time. They are we we won against them, Sephora. We failed against them on the other sides. So it's it's a constant and very hard competition. They are very performant editor, all integrated. Aqua tries to help, but well, not so easy to help with uh, uh, marketing cloud, for example, for Adobe. So Adobe is a, on one level, it's it's a big competition, but. On the other side, we also have to compete with agencies, big agencies, because we have now creative guys inside and we change our logo for those who know us since several years. 
So we're now also moving from, in, from Drupal development team but to also to a consulting UX and design things. And the path is where we, we took is to going, not to doing websites anymore because, well, we do websites obviously, but we, it's not our core business. Our core business now is doing enterprise application because it's something where on the left we have Capgemini integrators, but they do shitty job in design and UX and ideas. And on the right, we have very nice designs from agency, but they don't know how to do critical enterprise application integrated with SAP, CRM, reporting, etc. So this is our uh, expertise now. So going to enterprise application, complex stuff inside critical businesses. So now we're competing against everybody. So, so but, well, it's a game. Uh, there was a, yeah. So you have two guys in uh, both sales and in boring. Yeah. And how do you manage competition? Mm. Ah, the, well, their, their organization is way more structured. We have uh, we have a CEO manager, then we have uh, five to six HR managers, office managers, recruiters, recruiting companies. So this the the, the organization of production is extremely organized, because uh, well we we have twelve offices across several countries, so we have to be very careful to spot the right guy and to try to hire him. So yeah, this it's it, it's a very structured organization. Yeah. Uh, you said um, you get almost one million euros of revenue from cold calling. Yeah. Where was the rest of the money? <laughs> but the, but the, the thing is, yes, uh, well, uh, there was some white powder, we, we sell it. <laughs> uh, no, uh, actually, as again, when you, s when you I take the new, so let's cold call, and, and I sign up um, a good client in London doing uh, uh, some publishing business, very nice, okay? Beautiful, perfect client. Uh, and then, once I've started, I give it to uh, my wonderful project manager, very beautiful, etc. And then all the, all the relationship is managed by these guys, so if there are new projects, new demands, it all goes to them, I don't touch it anyway. So he manages the rest, so the rest comes from project managers who are actually sales and Swiss knives. Yeah. We, we try to sell everything we can, but we're not always all, but, uh, uh, but 50, the good thing, we spend 50, about from 35 to 50% of development time on QA. This is, this is a standard metric. When we sell, well, we try to sell 30, 35%. It's, you know, we always you have a um, purchase manager saying, oh, you are too expensive, your rate, 50% of QA is way too much, we are used to 20, I say, okay. Well, but it's actually how you get quality and well. So it's complicated to sell QA, but well, at the end, they, uh, on fixed budget, they see the, the final number. They don't actually check the percentage, so 50%. Yep. S sorry, I, I, yeah. Yeah, we have only one cold call, cold caller. Uh, and it's it's a Maxim. He's a small Maxim. I'm the big Maxim. So it's Maxim team to maximize revenue. And uh, and the cold call guys. He, yeah, he's uh, alone. He he qualify. He's just a gem. He, it's complicated to find. Don't say to him he's a gem. He will ask for raise in salary. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he he qualifies and he selects the client. He calls. He calls. He calls again until they get the first meeting. And then I come in, and then we try to understand what their needs, etc. Finish? Like no, well, well I, I, I don't see how you can outsource your, your cold calling. I mean, th some bullshitter will call you, hey, hi, you want some Drupal shop? No, no, you cannot. You have to understand before calling, the guy spends about an hour before calling a company, an hour to just qualify who they are, what they do, what are the existing technology, who are their competition references, and it's qualification asked to somebody who knows your business. You cannot outsource just calling. It's not just calling and understand and calling the right person and saying, I'm calling from your boss, who is your boss? Ah, you know, it's, it's, it's a quite complicated process. So that's a bit more about quality time. Yes, yes, you don't need to call everybody. You have to just call Total, uh, Ectron, uh, I don't know, uh, General Electric and, and big companies. Then the rest you, well, but you spend your efforts on the big ones. Yes, one big client is better than, than ten small, yes. Okay, yeah? 
It's, it's four questions, you know this. <laughs> the percentage is Y level, KPI alert, where? Uh, this is cold calling. You call and you cannot end up with everything. You can go to dinner with them or, or I don't know, but you, you can sell them, try to sell a project. Well, it's cold calling. It's, it's a random process. You have to adapt each second to what your, your, your guy is saying. So it's, it's, it's very different. You cannot formalize like you do this and this and this. There is no script. You can say uh, it's personal to bypass a secretary. You can, you can say checking his boss, saying I'm calling from his boss and, and, and how oh, he's scared. So he will, uh, it's, it's all depends. So. Yeah, there was false question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was interested in uh, the structure. As you mentioned, that you don't get account manager, for example, on a project level, uh, when there is kind of escalation, I don't know, what is the upper level after the project manager? And I'll combine the question. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good at sales. Actually, we able to hire you to, to, to upsell things. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is that it may be a bottleneck at some point? It is absolutely. Look at my uh, my eyes. Uh, it's absolutely bottleneck. So I, I'm finishing the bid now because you don't see my second screen. So I just filling up because I have to send it in five minutes. No. Yes. It's absolutely bottleneck. We'll try to resolve that. And escalation. Well, we have several levels of escalation. We have project director. We have a CEO, and we have me and, and and my partner. So, but we don't have escalation because every project happens so good. Okay, thank you guys. I think we are running the time.